Hi friends, Pastor Doug Batchelor here. You know, periodically someone will uh, email me and they'll draw my attention to a YouTube where people are saying something uh, negative and critical about Seventh-day Adventists. And there's a lot of misinformation out there on the internet. You realize anybody can say anything. And some people watch these programs and they're easily persuaded. But you know, I thought it would be maybe helpful if I took uh, one of these and I went through point by point some of the criticisms that people have where they're saying that Seventh-day Adventists are a cult or you need to watch out for Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, I appreciate this one that was produced by the Master's Seminary. We're gonna play it for you. I'm gonna pause it along the way. I like it because they br basically broke the criticisms down into three easy to understand points. And so uh, just uh, be with me now. Let me just tell you, I am a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I have not always been. I used to go to church on Sunday and I attended other denominations. When I continued to read the Bible and I learned the Bible truth, I became a Seventh-day Adventist. Nobody in my family was a Seventh-day Adventist. I realized that it might make me unpopular in some circles, but I wanted to go by the scriptures. So with that little introduction, I'd like to get into this video. I'll just play segments of it. I'll stop it along the way and I'll do my best to be fair and let them make their points. Hi, I'm Jamie Jackson with the Master's Seminary and joining me right now is Dr. Nate Buznitz. Dr. Buznitz, thanks so much for joining me. Absolutely. Uh, I wanna talk about uh, Seventh-day Adventism. How should we as believers view that denomination? Well, even the word denomination is one that raises questions mm -hmm. in the minds of some evangelicals. Should Seventh-day Adventism be considered an, a, a denomination? Okay, I gotta pause right there because they're saying, now first of all, this is Dr. Nathan Busnitz, and uh, he is a teacher at the Master's Seminary in Los Angeles, California. We've never met, seems like a nice enough gentleman. Be happy to talk to him, be happy to debate him on some of these issues publicly if he was interested. But he said that uh, Seventh-day Adventists should not even be considered a denomination. Well, I think that that was maybe a little over the top because the word denomination simply means it's the way of naming or classifying things. Uh, all denominations, uh, need a name to identify them, to register, to show they're separate, and to put a name on the building, to say Seventh-day Adventists cannot be a denomination is like saying that the $1 bill is telling the $5 bill you cannot be a denomination. Well, they're both denominations. They're named, they're classified. And so, yes, we can be classified. Historically, it's been regarded as a cult, mm -hmm. though there are some in uh, more recent decades who want to have more of an open, attitude towards Adventists. I'm talking about an evangelical perspective. So, so the question is one that has been raised. All right, so they're basically saying that uh, there's disagreement among evangelicals about whether or not Seventh-day Adventists should be classified as a cult. A number of years ago, uh, Donald Barnhouse and Walter Martin wrote a book. They worked together on a book. I think uh, Martin principally wrote the book called Kingdom of the Cults. And the conclusion of that book was Seventh-day Adventists are not to be categorized as a cult. Historically, the Adventist movement actually started in the early 19th century, in the 1800s. There was a man named William Miller. William Miller believed through his study of scripture that he had figured out when Jesus was going to come back. Mm -hmm. He said Jesus was going to return sometime between March 21st, 1843 and March 21st, 1844. Uh, the Lord Jesus did not return. And so he adjusted his date and said, no, it's going to be October 22nd, 1844. His followers were known as the Millerites. And when Jesus didn't come back on that date, they experienced what they call the great disappointment. Mm -hmm. And obviously Miller's calculations, his predictions did not come true. All right, just want to what he's saying is correct right now. Uh, William Miller, who is a Baptist preacher, uh, he did um, uh, do some incredible prophetic Bible study. He came to the date of 1844 when he studied the prophecies in Daniel chapter eight, and it said the sanctuary would be cleansed. He thought that meant that the earth was the sanctuary to be cleansed by fire, even though there's really nothing in the Bible that says that the earth was to be considered the sanctuary. Um, Seventh-day Adventists were not organized as a denomination until 1863. So I just want everyone to have a picture of the span that took place between the great disappointment in 1844 and the organization of the Seventh-day Adventists as a denomination in about 1863. 
Most people realized that his calculations had been wrong, but there was a small group who said, wait a second, maybe his calculations aren't wrong. Maybe it's just the event he associated with his calculations that is wrong. The early Seventh-day Adventists came up with the doctrine of what they call Christ's heavenly work of atonement. Mm -hmm. and what they say is that on October 22nd, 1844, Jesus went from the, the holy place in the heavenly sanctuary into the holy of holies to continue a second work of atonement in heaven, something they call a work of investigative judgment. Mm -hmm. It's not Seventh-day Adventists that manufactured the teaching that Christ is still ministering in the heavenly temple. And yes, we do believe that the work of heavenly ministry of Jesus is still going on. This is a Bible teaching. And uh, well, I should, I should let him continue with what he's saying here and, and uh, give people the whole picture. So that's how the whole movement got started. And uh, a young woman named Ellen Harmon, later married Ellen G. White is her married name. She began to receive visions through these visions that she received, supposedly. Uh, she gave really the, the basis to the Seventh-day Adventist movement. So let's talk about uh, the Sabbath, because obviously they meet on Saturday, but they have a wrong view of what the Sabbath is, biblically speaking. Well, yeah, I would say that there's really three big problems with Seventh-day Adventist right, doctrine, three major reasons why evangelicals should be very concerned and why they shouldn't just embrace Adventism as a denomination. It's, mm -hmm. it's not a denomination. It's something that really is outside of evangelical, biblical Christianity. Three reasons why. Number one would be that they do have, in spite of some of the statements that they make about salvation being by grace, they really do have a legalistic understanding of the gospel. And that's seen in their insistence that Christians observe the Sabbath and that Christians observe certain dietary laws out of Leviticus 11 and so on. All right. Are, are we legalists? Why is he saying we're legalists? Because he says we insist that people keep the Sabbath. Is it Seventh-day Adventists that create the Ten Commandments? Or is God commanding? Are these the Ten Recommendations? If Seventh-day Adventists were telling people they should turn from their sins, stop killing, stop lying, stop committing adultery, are you then categorized as a legalist for doing that? We did not write the Ten Commandments. This is a Bible teaching that we are to encourage people to turn from sin. We just believe that you need to put the Sabbath truth in the same category as the other Ten Commandments. It's right in the middle of the Ten Commandments. It begins with the word remember. And so do you become a cult because you believe in all Ten Commandments instead of just nine or eight commandments? Um, and then he goes on to say that uh, well, we're legalists. We believe in righteousness by faith that we're saved by grace. If you look, for instance, in baptismal vow number three, I accept the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary as the atoning sacrifice for my sins and believe that through faith in his shed blood, I am saved from sin and its penalty. So this is our official teaching. By the way, you'll notice that um, Dr. Boosneth in his uh, comments, he never opens up any book. He never quotes from any document. He sits in front of a sign of Master Seminary and he basically shoots from the hip. Um, our official teachings make it very clear. We do believe in salvation by faith, but we also believe that Jesus said, people need to turn from their sins. Christ began teaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The apostles, repent and be baptized. Repent of your sins. What is sin? Transgression of God's law. So if you're still part of a church that's teaching the Ten Commandments, you're a legalist. But uh, you know, I'll get to that a little more in just a minute. So we'll carry on. The Apostle Paul addresses those issues in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, makes it very clear that as Christians, as those who are no longer bound by the old covenant because we are under the new covenant in Christ, that we're not bound to observe the Sabbath or observe dietary laws. The rest of the New Testament uh, really underscores the fact that believers met on the first day of the week, the day of Christ's resurrection. So that's one. Okay. Well, he mentioned Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. Let's read that and find out what Paul is saying here. 
Colossians 2, start with verse 13. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he's made alive together with him, having forgiven all of your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. Now, 10 commandments were not written by a man's hand. They were written by the finger of God. The Bible talks about the ceremonial laws and the ceremonial Sabbaths that were written by the hand of Moses. It actually uses that phrase. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements which was against us. Why does it say against us? Well, because the Bible says that the ceremonial laws were placed in a pocket outside of the Ark of the Covenant that it might be a witness against you. Never said that about the Ten Commandments. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, taking it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. This here is clearly talking about the handwriting of Moses, which was put on parchment, it's nailed to the cross, those ceremonial Sabbaths and laws, they were put in a pocket on the outside of the ark, and God said that it may be a witness against you. The very language used here is talking specifically about the ceremonial laws and Sabbaths. Ten Commandments have not been wiped away. The only one of the Ten Commandments they have a problem with is the fourth commandment that begins with the word, remember the Sabbath day. You're not a legalist if you teach all 10, you're being biblical. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regard of a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, and sentence doesn't end, Sabbaths which are a shadow of things to come but the substance is of Christ. Those Sabbaths that are nailed to the cross are the annual feast days of the Jews. Christians historically from the time of Christ to the present day have all believed that the Sabbath should be kept. It's only in recent years they're saying the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross and we've just reattached nine of them, which is really an absurd teaching. And uh, I would ask these gentlemen, do they go to church on Sunday? Where is the command in the New Testament to go to church on Sunday? They say, well, the Bible says that this is the teaching. Where? Where does it say? Show me one command in the whole Bible that we are to now keep the first day of the week as the new Sabbath. There is no command. And so they say, well, it was the habit of the disciples to meet on the first day of the week. Uh, there are occasions they met on the first day of the week, and it says, and they met daily, and they met Thursday for the Lord's Supper, and Jesus died on Friday and uh, he rested in the tomb on the Sabbath, and he rose Sunday, never declared it to be a new Sabbath day. So this is all based upon a, a myth that has no scripture to support it. Okay, we're gonna go back and play a little more. One big concern is this legalistic understanding of what's required for Christians, the Sabbath, dietary laws, etc. Okay, dietary laws. Um, the dietary laws are not a Jewish law. The Bible tells us that God gave Adam and Noah dietary laws. By the way, the whole world is in a lot of trouble right now because Eve ate something and Adam they were not supposed to eat. And what parent is gonna ever tell their children, we don't really care what you eat, you just pray over it. Of course we care what our children eat because we love them. God cares what his children eat. And God told Noah, when you take the animals on the ark, take the clean ones by seven, the unclean ones, two by two, they were not to be used for food or for sacrifice. This is a Bible teaching, even in the New Testament. Peter says, not so, Lord, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And so it was the teaching of the disciples and of Jesus all through the Bible not to eat unclean foods is this work of heavenly atonement. We know from the book of Hebrews that Christ's work of atonement was once for all on the cross. Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 10, after he completed that once for all sacrifice, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Okay, he says that uh, we believe that uh, the work of Christ in heaven is not complete. Well, that's true. That's what the Bible teaches. He's making it sound like because we believe that Jesus has a continuing work in the heavenly sanctuary that we don't believe his work on the cross was adequate or sufficient. Seventh-day Adventists 100% believe that the sacrifice of Christ and the blood he shed was adequate and sufficient to provide salvation for the sins of the whole world, that he doesn't need to be sacrificed again. That is a one-time work. It is complete. 
Even Ellen White, who they later will accuse of being the foundation for our teachings, supports that the work of Christ is complete. She wrote in Manuscript 128, 1897, Our great high priest completed the sacrificial offering of himself when he suffered without the gate. Then a perfect atonement was made for the sins of the people. And here's one more. The sacrifice of Christ is sufficient. He made a whole efficacious offering to God. The human effort without the merit of Christ is worthless. That's the Review and Herald, August 19, 1890. But the idea that Christ's atonement is over, it's not an Adventist teaching, that is a Bible teaching. If you look in the Bible, when Jesus died on the cross, that wasn't the end of his ministry as our high priest. He continues his work as our high priest. Look, for instance, in Hebrews 9, verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, that's future, with greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. The Bible says there's a heavenly temple. All you've got to do is read in Isaiah, I saw the Lord on his throne, surrounded by the two Shekinah cherubim. You read in uh, Revelation 1, Jesus is appearing among the seven candlesticks. Revelation talks about the altar of incense. Revelation talks about the altar of sacrifice. Revelation talks about the Ark of the Covenant. All the furniture that you found in the earthly temple we see in heaven in Revelation and in the prophecies of Zechariah, Ezekiel, Isaiah. And so this is a Bible teaching. And then look in Hebrews here, Hebrews 6, verse 20. It says, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Christ is our high priest. He has entered into heaven. He is interceding in our behalf there. That's this next verse, Hebrews 7, 24. But he, because he continues, it's not over. <laughs> he continues forever. He has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is our high priest. He is still saving people. He is still stretching out his nail-pierced hands before the Father as our mediator. So the idea that the work of atonement is over, that's not true. The, the sacrifice is over, yes, but the, the atoning work of Jesus is not over. Uh, Christ is still interceding for his people up there. Now, when you look at the earthly sanctuary, the altar was the first thing that you saw when you entered into the sanctuary. That's like the cross. That's where the sacrifice took place. It was not the end. It was the beginning. And then you went on to the, the, the labor. There's You get the baptism and the fire of the altar, the Holy Spirit, and you went into the holy place and ultimately to the most holy place. The cross is the beginning. If the cross was the end, how come we're still here? It's just so obvious that the plan of salvation is still playing out Christ for whatever reason. He's said that um, his work is not done in transforming the church. He wants a church that's gonna represent him. When the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt, was the sacrifice of the lamb the last thing they did before they entered the promised land or the first thing they did before they left Egypt? It was the first thing. It was the beginning of a journey. So this gentleman saying that the sacrifice is the end well, it, it is sufficient, it is adequate, but the work of Christ goes on. We don't believe there's a second sacrifice or a second atonement that takes place. Nothing in the New Testament indicates that he's performing a second work of atonement in we heaven. We don't believe that. So this idea of adding to Christ's work of atonement, it's really problematic. And, and even How the investigative judgment side of it, Christ's work. Christ is looking at people's works to see who's worthy to enter heaven. That again is a works-based legalistic. Believing that Christ is looking at works is works-based. And this is some Adventist teaching. Friends, let me read it to you. And this is not from an Adventist book. This is from the Bible, Revelation 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which was the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things that were written in the books. Revelation 22, 12, last chapter in the Bible. Behold, I'm coming quickly. This is red letter, words of Jesus. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. You can read the last chapter in Ecclesiastes. There Solomon says in chapter 12, verse 14, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing. Paul says, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Why would you say that a church is legalistic for teaching all of the Bible, not just some of the Bible? Yes, there is a judgment day. We're saved by our faith, but we are judged by our works. And uh, 
the works show whether or not you've allowed the gospel to transform you and to sanctify you and that you've been saved. It's not legalism. See, that's kind of the dirty word that uh, some churches paint other churches. If you teach the commandments of God, then they try to pin the word legalism on you, make you look like a Pharisee. But you know, these are the things that Paul said, that Peter said, that James said, that Jesus said. Paul said, it is not the hearers of the law that will be justified before God, but the doers of the law will be justified, Romans chapter two, verse 13. And so believing scripture does not make you legalistic. Legalistic understanding of salvation, I think it's a big problem. And then the third major area of concern would be with regard to the way Ellen G. White is treated. They elevate Ellen G. White as an authoritative prophetess. Mm -hmm. And any time you have a movement that elevates anyone or anything to a level of equal authority, and in reality greater authority than scripture, because they say that scripture has to be interpreted through the lens of Ellen G. White, I think you are setting yourself up for major, major problems. All right, now that, this is the third. So he's itemized the three things, the three reasons they say that evangelicals are supposed to look at Seventh-day Adventists as a cult. One is because we believe all 10 commandments. Uh, that I think is absurd. The second one is they say that we don't believe the work of Christ was completed by the cross. We do believe that the salvation of Christ uh, provided on the cross is, was adequate for one time, covered the sins of the world, is completely sufficient, but the work of atonement is clearly not over based on the scriptures that I gave you, that Christ is still ministering as our high priest in heaven. It's true. And the third thing they say that, and I hear this all the time, that we put Ellen White on an equal or a higher plane for, with the Bible, or we must interpret the Bible through Ellen White. That is categorically not true. Now, you know, let me just say something. Whenever you're trying to find out what the truth is, and you're evaluating what a church believes. Um, I've seen this before where, you know, there'll be some disaster in a neighborhood, a hurricane will go through, and the news crew will come in, and they jump out of their truck, and they take the microphone, and they walk over to someone who's standing on the street, and all the neighbors are looking, they're going, oh, please, don't interview him. Do not give the microphone to that guy. That is the village idiot. Every church, especially a church that's got millions of believers, if you want to take a letter or writing or an email post and interview one person and say this is what they believe, that's not fair. If you want to find out what a church believes, go to what the Bible says uh, and go to what their official teachings are. And so if you look at the official teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we do not believe that the writings of Ellen White are on an equal plane, higher, or that the Bible should be interpreted through the writings of Ellen White. Let me just give you some stuff on that. Um, if you join the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you go through a series of 13 baptismal vows. Baptismal vow number five reads this way. By the way, Ellen White's name does not appear anywhere in our baptismal vows. It says, I believe the Bible is God's inspired word and it constitutes the only, the Bible constitutes the only rule of faith and practice for the Christian. This is not something new, this is what we believe. If you look at the writings of Ellen White, it says the people of God are directed to the scriptures as their safeguard against the influence of false teachers and delusive powers of spirits of darkness. By their testimony, every statement, not by my testimony, by their testimony, every statement must be tested. That's Great Controversy, page 593. Here's another statement by Ellen White, lest you think that she was saying her writings or, or um, instruction was to be on an equal level or above the Bible. He, Christ, pointed to the scriptures as of unquestionable authority, and we should do the same. The Bible is to be presented as the word of the infinite God, as the end of all controversy and the foundation of all faith. It would be absolutely abhorrent to Ellen White to hear anybody in our church say that her writings were to be put on an equal level or above the te teachings of Christ. And now if you go to the official, the longer, not just the baptismal vows, but if you go to our book of 27 Fundamentals, it's a more exhaustive uh, book. It says the official statement in the Seventh-day Adventist Church says, the Bible is the standard by which all teachings and experience must be tested. Now you may find uh, some Seventh-day Adventists out there that are not balanced and they make too much of Ellen White's writings. You know, uh, you can find Lutherans. By the way, Martin Luther had a couple of dreams and visions. Did you know that? 
And I believe God used Luther. I believe Luther was inspired, not on the level of the Bible. But you're gonna find some Lutherans are always quoting Luther. And you're gonna find some Baptists and they're always quoting Calvin as though Calvin is the last word. And you're gonna find some Methodists, they're always quoting John Wesley. And I believe God spoke through Luther and Wesley and Calvin. I believe that God inspired Ellen White in an even more specific way, but she never called herself a prophetess. But we do believe in the gift of prophecy. And the Bible teaches that this is a Bible teaching. 1 Corinthians 12, verse nine and 10. To another, talking about the gifts of the Spirit, by the same Spirit, the gifts of healing, by the same Spirit. To another, working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. So one of the gifts of the Spirit is the gift of prophecy. You can read in 1 Corinthians 14, verse one. Paul said, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Verse three, he who prophesies speaks with edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. Now keep in mind, in the early church, they did not view every prophecy that God may have given a person as something to be add, added to the canon of scripture. You can read in Acts 21, verse nine, speaking of Philip, it says, now this man had four virgin daughters who did prophesy. We don't have the books of the four daughters of Philip. And so it was common to believe that the gift of prophecy is one of the gifts of the church. Before I was a Seventh-day Adventist, I worshiped a lot with charismatic Pentecostal Assembly of God Christians. I was in their services. They were jumping up all the time and uttering prophecies. And yet, they don't call them a cult. And so they very much, all you gotta do is just turn your channel on Sunday morning, you're gonna hear some of these pastors say, I've got a word from the Lord. And they, they say it's a gift of prophecy. So to categorize a church as a cult because they still believe in the gift of prophecy, and we do not believe that the writings of Ellen White are equal to the Bible or, on, or, um, the, or above the Bible, or that the Bible should be interpreted through her teachings. Um, I do evangelism all the time. Everything I believe, all the doctrines I believe as a Seventh-day Adventist, I go right to the Bible. But something you're gonna notice as you bounce around a little bit online, is that when people wanna criticize the Seventh-day Adventist Church, instead of going point by point through the doctrinal teachings, what they do is they kinda of create a straw man argument and they talk about Ellen White and then they make a big deal out of that. You know, just while we're on the subject, friends, uh, here you've got a woman who lived about 87 years. For 70 years of her life, she was involved in public ministry. Her family supported her in what she was doing. Uh, she wrote more than any other woman in American history. Her books are in the libraries. A lot of evangelical pastors have her books and they use it as an inspired commentary before they preach. I hear them on the radio and television. They will not tell you I got this from Ellen White, but I know her writings and I can tell when they've been reading her books. I've heard them quote her on the radio. And uh, she's powerful, powerful. You know, before you reject something, I recommend you look at it. Here we've got a, a doctor of theology who's making these blanket statements. No references, no quote. He simply sits down in front of a university sign. That's supposed to give you credibility. So. If you're gonna buy a box of cereal, read the ingredients. If you wanna know what a church believes, look at their official statement of what they believe. See if it matches up with the Bible. So why are they taking all this time and energy to undermine or to criticize or to try to put that badge of cult on Seventh-day Adventists? Well, if you look at the statistics right now in North America, virtually every mainline church is in free fall when it comes to membership. Methodists, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Baptists, and a number of the other mainline churches, their membership is plummeting. Seventh-day Adventists are still growing. And right now we have about 20 million members. It is a movement. People are turning back to the Bible and, that, and they're finding out what the Bible really says. There's been a great revival, a primitive Bible study, and people are saying, yeah, why don't we keep the Sabbath? Why aren't we following uh, you know, all these guidelines and teachings in the Bible? And so it's been moving and they're frankly a little threatened by that. Once again, if you're blessed by these programs, we'd encourage you to go ahead, click the like button. I'd invite you to subscribe to my channel and then pass on the good news to your friends. God bless and don't forget, if you'd like more information on 
What the Bible really says about the law and grace is obedience legalism. We'll give you this free book. It's called, Does God's Grace Blot Out the Law? Just click on the link below and it will be yours. Read it and then share it with others. God bless.